Hi, everyone, and welcome to The X, a podcast from inside Silicon Valley about how experience shapes everything from products to businesses to entire industries. I'm Brian McLean, and I'm here with Demetrius Madrigal. Today, we're going to talk about Samsung's new Galaxy Ring and the state of the union on wearable technology. These little devices can really pack a big punch these days, and we want to dig into the user experience and why we think we might all end up using one sooner than later. Good morning, D. How are you? Good. I was just thinking about this product because I've been using a uh, Pixel Watch for the last couple of months and really liked it. And I actually ordered a new chest strap heart rate monitor yesterday. Mm. Yeah. I had to go down the rabbit hole of like, oh, what features do I actually want and which ones do I need? And I was at the end of the day, I was like, I don't need all these extra things like an EKG stuff going on. Just yeah. get something basic. Yeah, yeah. So uh, before we jump in and talk about the rings, why don't you give us a little bit of feedback on why you started using some of these health features and uh, what your overall thoughts are? Well, the big thing for me was uh, just having better fitness tracking for kind of exercise, heart rate, that kind of stuff. Uh, and once I got it, I definitely came across additional features that I didn't expect were going to be very big for me, but they turned out to be. One of them is it can track with something like 96% accuracy if you start to experience um, AFib, um, it's atrial fibrillation or other uh, heart arrhythmias. And my dad had AFib, he had strokes, my uncle had AFib and strokes, my cousin had AFib and strokes. So it's kind of runs in the family. So if you are someone who has a history of this, then it is a good idea to have something along these lines to let you know when this stuff is cropping up. But it, it can't diagnose it for you, right? It just lets yeah. you know that there's something going on and you should probably get it checked out. No, and and to be fair, even if you're going out and getting an EKG, it's not the device that diagnoses you. It is a doctor who's taking a look at it and interpreting that data, which is kind of like us when we're looking at data and we're making an interpretation. Uh, and a lot of our work is, hey, we have all this data. We don't know what it means. Can you guys take a look and let us know what you think? Yeah. So it's the kind of thing where like, hey, you get a notification, then you set up your doctor's appointment and have them take a look. But at least it lets you know that, hey, you, need, you should get looked at and checked out. Yeah. I mean, when this, when all these devices first started coming out and they started like developing different ways in order to track. So it started very simply, remember it was just steps, right? And mm -hmm. then from steps, it went to like heart rate and then heart rate to, uh, um, what was it? Uh, accelerometers that can determine whether you know, you're on your back or you're standing up and you know, whether you're swimming or running versus this and that and it's getting more and more complex. There was like this huge time period where it was like very, very popular. And then a lot of those companies actually like consolidated. And mm -hmm. I remember like Google ended up buying Motorola and brought in a lot of that technology. Um, Apple started slowly integrating it into their phones. And then from their phones, they're now integrated into watches, obviously, and things like that. One of the things that's always been on my mind is form factor. So that's why I'm glad we're talking about the rings today. Um, mm -hmm. Form factor matters a lot because not everybody wants to be carrying an extra device. Not everybody wants to have their phone with them every moment of the day if they're exercising. Or like in my case, when I used to swim a lot, so now I do less swimming and more cycling. But like when I swam a lot, it's like I didn't have my phone with me. I locked it up in a locker and I would jump in the pool. So that means I had to buy an extra device in order to use any of these tracking features. And now I'm starting to see them integrated in the goggles. And like everyone's trying to figure out how to give you this data. But at the end of the day, form factor is such a big part of it because if people don't want to carry it or it feels intrusive, then they just won't use it, right? So that's like phase one. So what are your thoughts on the different form factors that we're seeing now? So watches, phones, rings, um, mm -hmm. additional, like you said, like straps and things. Like, do you feel like people are going to adopt these at the, at the rate that these tech uh, companies are hoping that they will? Uh, I, I think they will um i i think for a ring i think it's a little bit more niche than a watch uh for a few reasons one the cost and two it doesn't have as all of the features that you would get on a watch uh and we were saying earlier but it has the main thing which is you know sleep tracking health stuff exercise things like that and we we were saying this when when um the wearables were first starting to come out was and this happens like our thought process, when any kind of new technology or a new product comes out, we ask ourselves, what can this do that other things can't? Correct. So what can a wearable do that like a smartphone or a laptop or, or any other kind of computerized device can't do? And that is to track all of your health stuff. Um, 
And that is a thing that the ring has um, that is maintained. So the fact that it's not going to show you your calendar notifications or that the phone's com- phone calls coming in or things like that, it's not as big a deal because it's doing the main stuff. So the form factor thing is important because it, it gets to, to users where they want it to be. So some people are going to com- prefer a watch. Some people are going to prefer a ring. Some people are going to prefer ear, um, earbuds, whatever they happen to be. It's just um, going to be based on factors of their life, like what kind of exercise they're doing, what kind of things they're doing, what's more comfortable for them. If you are, if you want to wear like your own watch, if you want to wear a, a Hublot or a Rolex or something like that, based on the uh, price point for these rings, then you can wear that and still track everything that you want that you're tracking. Yeah. Well, here's the thing though about form factor. It almost seems like if a company really wants to ensure that they get the largest user base, based on what you're saying, is they have to mm-hmm. have, which costs a lot in development. You have to have the ring, you have to have the watch, you have to have the phone, you, have to, you know, in order to capture everybody. Um, I think the golden, you know, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow basically is: can you get a form factor that pretty much anyone would adopt and doesn't mind adopting? And mm-hmm. I feel like that's where they think these rings are coming in. My thought process is a little different. I think that anybody who spends $400 on the ring probably already has the watch and likes it, but wants to be able to track more consistently because you have to take your watch off to charge it or if you're doing certain things. So now you can have a device that's more persistent. I don't know. That's interesting. Yeah. I I wish we had that that, uh, data from the company to find out if that's the case. But like in my mind, it's like, oh, well, if you already have it on your watch, why do you want to spend $400 and get another device? to do it yeah for myself i'm like if you really value all of the sleep tracking and health stuff then you would it's it's hard to really understand how much of an impact it has until you experience it so it becomes like how how do you experience it without having something that can do it for you see what i'm confused about is that like a lot of these companies are developing these pretty cool devices they give you all this data and everything but uh I've always found that they're really walking a fine line on telling you whether or not you should be doing something versus are you healthy, unhealthy, like, you know, like, like, because they're not FDA approved devices, right? So they'll give you that percentage, like, oh, your sleep was 80% tonight, right? Um, I think that's kind of low key, like, that's not going to cause a lot of impact. But like, if you say, hey, I think you have AFib, or... Mm -hmm. um, or your stress levels are too high, something's going to happen or whatever, and it starts freaking people out. Uh, at what point are you now, you know, basically providing people with a medical device versus just a tracking device to give you insight, right? It's a very fine line. Yeah. Well, I think the perspective is we're going to give you data and give you a little bit in how to interpret that data. Like you can look up how your sleep relates to, to other people. And uh, that's useful. Uh, and ultimately I think this kind of product really appeals to kind of the optimizers, the people who are looking at like, all right, how can I get a little bit more out of my sleep? How can I get a little bit more out of my exercise? You know, how does my cardio fitness relate to like a, a, a global standard or a national standard or something like yeah. that? Um, if you, that's, if that's stuff that's not interesting to you, that's, this just isn't probably the device for you. either. Yeah, that that's true. Um, I was thinking about it and, there are certain things that are interesting, like to me personally, and then other things that are not right. So I like the sleep one a lot. I think that's really awesome. I think, and I've told this on the podcast before, and it's a little bit of a strange thing about me, but like you give me too much information about my health. I'm going to start to do, put on my researcher hat and then I'm going to start to go and do deep dives. And then I'm going to have more anxiety about it. So if you're like, I think something's wrong with your heart, I'd be like, God, now I got to have go to a cardiologist because this machine tells me that they think that something's wrong. And then now I'm spinning about like, okay, I got to yeah. schedule an appointment. Should I go? Should I not go? Is it the device? You know, I look up online and then of course everything online basically tells you you're going to die. So <laughs> and then it goes down that rabbit hole. So like there's certain things that are like effective and certain things that are like sure. not effective for my personality. Well, on the but other I, side of things, if you're, if you're concerned about your heart and you have this thing on and it's like, oh no, my heart rate's fine. It says my heart, it's not telling me that I've got any arrhythmias going on. It's like, okay, everything's going good. Then it's kind of reassuring in a way. 
Yeah, yeah. So there's that, right? Yeah. <laughs> so there's the there's the flip side of it, right? Yeah. It's, there's and, uh, another interesting thing along those lines. Sorry, uh, I'll just get this out because so it kind of relates to that. I was really interested. I didn't get this for the sleep tracking, but I started using it for that because I was I was curious more than anything. Uh-huh. And I've been trying to get you know it through grad school and starting the business and everything else. I was getting like you know four to six hours of sleep for most of my life. I would say. Yeah. In the last few years, I've been like, all right, let's try to get seven or eight. And, uh, so I've been trying to get at least seven hours of sleep. And, uh, when I started wearing the watch, there were a few nights where I got like four hours sleep, five hours sleep, six hours sleep. And I thought that my sleep score would tank and I took a look at it and it didn't, it moved a little bit. I actually got one of the highest sleep scores I've gotten in a while and only slept for six hours last night. And it's because my sleep apparently is really efficient. Like you can look Mm -hmm. at at the benchmark versus other users and my time spent awake is really low and I get a lot of really deep sleep early and REM sleep kind of in intermediate. So I can, I can probably do better with sleep deprivation than plenty of other people who toss and turn a lot, or they don't get a lot of deep sleep or a lot of REM sleep. They don't get a lot of recovery in their sleep. So they need more hours of sleep. Yeah. And that I think is a useful, uh, useful bit of information. And it's reassuring that like, Oh, Hey, you can stand up a bit to not getting quite as much sleep. That's not, that wasn't just like something you made up for yourself when you were in grad school. Although, although D I would push back on that. And I would say over the last, I don't know how long it's been or whatever, you've been way more diligent about exercise. And, and when you exercise pretty heavily during the day, you end up getting much, most people do much deeper sleep at night because your body's fatigued and then it gets really good sleep. So like, I'd like to see, but you don't have it, which is the data of like, when you're not exercising as much, but you're like working and or in grad school, that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. versus now where like, it seems like you're out every day doing something. Well, I'll point out that yesterday I didn't, I did not do any exercise because I rolled my ankle like an idiot. Um, Uh And that was one of the reasons why I only got six hours of sleep because I was like, it took me a while to fall asleep when I have this throbbing, painful ankle. Yeah. Uh, And I still had really good sleep. So that's, you know, I've kind of always had a fair amount of exercise. I've definitely stepped it up in the the past. Yeah, it seems like it. Yeah. But uh, regardless, I think that that is uh, probably something that would take us a, a length of time before it dropped off. But I've also been pretty successful for a long time at like getting four, six hours of sleeping and being still efficient, but having something like this as researchers who are really into data, it kind of like makes us want to experiment. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. What happens if I get two hours of sleep or four hours of sleep and uh, for a week and see what happens. And if you're, if that's your mindset, it's probably a good idea to resist that kind of thing. Yeah. I heard something from a a guy had spent his entire career studying sleep and he said, that the if you if you average it out across the percentage of oh, let me ask you better I'll, I'll frame it this way what percentage of the population as a whole so not within your age group not within but but just as a whole who can who get who could get effective good recovery sleep that is less than six hours what percentage do you think it is uh twenty percent zero really. So basically what they found is, is they, as they're studying large uh, populations on sleep, is that on average, a human being needs six hours plus sleep. Like in the aggregate, like they need six hours. When you uh, take someone, you drop them to like four hours or less consistently, that mm-hmm. that per- they just can't survive that. Like they could handle it maybe for a period of time, but they can't handle it for a long period of time. It's not, it's just not sustainable. Like if he's like, Oh, I only sleep four hours a night all the time, like every night of the week, um, it, your health drops off. Like it just doesn't, doesn't equal out. And so basically like the fact that you can have days where it slides and you still get good sleep says that your body is like really good at re- rebounding and just saying like, we're going to grab yeah. this REM sleep really quickly. Now, if you did the experiment would be starting tomorrow D for the next two weeks. To, to I want you to clear, only sleep four hours. We're not going to do because it can be detrimental okay. to your health and don't yeah. do unethical experiments. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, but maybe yeah. it would be, it would be good. You know, only sleep four hours a night and see what happens or whatever. That's yeah. not, that's not good either. Uh, that's not yeah, good to be clear, what's been happening is oh, I'm getting seven hours, seven hours, seven hours, then something yeah, crazy four. or something unique happens and I get five. 
Like it's not like I'm getting four or five hours, like on, or, or even six hours, like on a regular basis. The other interesting one, dude, uh, is I'm curious about is that like I cannot drink coffee after let's say two o'clock in the afternoon, right? Because mm. I I don't know, kind of just wired, keeps me wired. You can drink coffee after dinner, and so what I'm curious oh, yeah. about, like if you drink coffee after dinner, do you do that every night or no? Uh, I usually drink tea, uh, uh-huh. and it can be a black tea, it could be a green tea, but every now and then I'll drink. A coffee, coffee at like 10 p.m. and go to sleep by midnight. But but what is your normal thing on a daily basis? Not uh, having I'll, tea. I'll have coffee in the morning, and if it's not like a heat wave, then I'll have tea around 10 o'clock at night. At night. Okay. And then just a, like a bunch to, of water. I'd like to see you completely remove the tea and see what happens. <laughs> I have all <laughs> kinds of interesting experiments I'd like to do on you. Well, I haven't been drinking tea for the past uh, couple of weeks because we've had this never-ending heat wave. Oh, okay. So okay. That's been a factor, but I've also been traveling and whatnot. So that's been a factor too. Oh, true. True. Yeah. Um, so no, it's, that's, it's one of, that's one of the issues when it comes to real life, like experimentation is there's so many different factors to track. Like so with so sleep in particular, right? It's like, no. uh, like what happens if you just have this chronic stress in the back of your mind because you're, you know, you lost your job versus like you're really happy and you're on vacation, yeah. right? There's so many things that affect sleep in general. But if but you're the on vacation, important- you're in a unique, you're in a weird bed with a weird pillow and a weird yeah, place. Exactly. So that affects it too. The thing that I think is probably the biggest factor for me, and this has turned into a sleep podcast, but we'll, <laughs> we'll move on. I have really good sleep hygiene. Yeah. I don't lay in bed for very long awake. I, yeah. I lay down, I read until I fall asleep. And then I turn, as soon as like I catch myself falling asleep, I turn the lights up, I put my phone away or, or whatever I'm reading on. And I change position from laying on my back to laying on my side. Uh-huh. And then I go to sleep and uh, I have everything in sleep mode. So I don't get disturbed by notifications. And I pretty much like, According to my my Pixel Watch's sleep tracking, my uh, time spent awake once I fall asleep is is significantly below the the average. That's awesome. Yeah. So you you have the same pattern as me. I, I only mm-hmm. use that sleep time is like I'm tired. I'm going to sleep. I'm not like laying in bed for hours. It's like it's just like I go to sleep. I close my eyes. I wake up. Like yeah. I'm not like playing too much in the bedroom. But yeah, and I, when I wake up in the morning, I tend to get up rel- relatively quickly. I might lie in bed for like 15, 20 minutes, like looking at checking news and notifications and things like that. But then I'm up and out. Oh, dude, I'm way worse than you. The second my eyes open, I'm out of bed within 30 seconds and in the shower. That's too and, much. That, that just feels like shower, it's stressful right there. And the shower, it is stressful. No, and, and, and the shower <laughs> the, is a warm shower for two minutes and then a solid cold shower for two minutes. Are you grabbing a bugle and playing reverie while you're at it? I know. Geez. Right. Like, no, it's true. I, I open my eyes and if the, especially if the sun is out. So if it's winter time, yeah. I'm more likely to lay there. But like, if the sun is coming through the window, I'm like, all right, I'm out. And, yeah, and then I've, it's just my brain. Yeah. It, this is unique to me maybe, but like I have a really hard time sleeping if there's light going on. Me too. Yeah. I have to yeah. like make it dark, 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 but we have to leave the window open a little. Otherwise the cat punches the window consistently. Anyways, yeah. we're, this is TMI for everybody, but, uh, <laughs> but anyways, I'll, I'll um, just say if you're going to be doing something like starting a business or going to grad school, the ability to function on small amounts of sleep and maximizing the sleep that you get is critical. I think back at grad school and stuff like that. I think I still had great hygiene. I used to go to sleep exactly the same time every night. But I, I just uh, would rather get up early and finish something than stay up late. So, you know, that's just kind of my mode. But let's talk specifically about these rings because um, I think they're kind of rad. So these uh, health monitoring devices uh, are designed to look at stress, sleep, and overall activity, steps, all that kind of good stuff, like tracking what's happening while you're sleeping, what's happening while you're exercising, and whether or not you can manage your stress. But the thing that really kind of excites me about it is the fact that it, it it gives you a very big bang for your buck. Like you're getting this $400 device where they are packing in sensors into this tiny little ring that you will forget about if you just leave it on and just mm-hmm. go on with your life and getting so much data and it's waterproof. It could be on you 24-7. Um, I think it's very cool. Not everybody wants a ring on their finger, just like not everybody wants a watch. I feel like this is the this really is the kind of like it's like cresting at to that point where I can imagine doctors and uh, health providers and health insurance companies starting to say we will reduce your premiums 
if you wear this device and share your data with your doctor? Yes. So I had my uh, physical, my annual physical uh, last month. And I definitely brought up the app and showed my doctor like, oh, here's what my, all of my cardio data is. And he looked at it and said, oh, that's, you know, that's great. Or like, let's work on that or, and those kinds of things. Uh, but it was a useful thing to have in the moment. And I can only imagine that growing to the point where you can, you know, share some of your live data and things like that with the doctor through an API or something like that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I imagine that the doctors could look at it and say, okay, over the course of the last, you know, three months since I've seen you, six months, whatever it is, uh, I noticed that you're like exercising regularly, you're getting good sleep. It looks like your stress levels have been, they go, they go up and they go down a little bit, but you're kind of managing them better. That's all on the right track. Um, they don't need to necessarily diagnose anything from it, but they can at least see where you are when you're not in the office. I find that going in the office, like my blood pressure goes up a little bit. Um, yeah, I sometimes yeah. forget to ask like, questions that I would be talking to you about and saying like, oh yeah, I wonder this or I wonder that. And then I forget to ask him when I go there, if I, it's like a, it's like a, for me, it's a little bit of an anxiety uh, provoking experience. Sure. But if I was able to bring data in and just share it, I feel like that would create a more fruitful conversation. Yeah. It gives them something that they can take a look at and know. That, uh, the other thing that happens is right when people are, have a physical coming up, they might be on their best behavior. Mm -hmm. Right. And yes. When the amount of exercise and the food they eat and like how they are, uh, how regimented they are with taking their medications might be different when they have a physical in two weeks than they do when they have like eight months until it is. Yeah. So that's true. having that kind of average data so you can take a look at it, especially over a long period of time, can be, I think, really useful for doctors. Well, I'll tell you this one of the things I think is amazing, 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 and is a huge unlock for Aura. I don't know if. Galaxy is going to, uh, Samsung Galaxy is going to do the same thing. But the Aura Ring, which is the competitor to this particular ring. So Aura has been around for a long time. They've been innovating in this space. Um, mm -hmm. And now Samsung's coming in. I'm sure there's going to be a million others. Uh, is there HSA and FSA eligible? So if you have mm -hmm. a health savings account or a flexible savings account associated with your job, then you can use that money to buy this, which is tax deductible. So you're basically getting it f almost for free. Because the money's being put in there tax free, and then you're then you're buying it. That is a key unlock. The next phase of that is what they do with um, people over the age of sixty five, which is they have this thing called a silver sneaker program, which is they'll going. To, uh, if I remember right, exactly how it works. If it's a hundred dollars or less per month, they will pay for your gym membership through oh, nice. health insurance, right? So if okay. health insurance starts paying for like tracking devices gym memberships, all these types of things, you're basically promoting a healthier lifestyle, which we know in the long term is going to decrease the amount of claims that you have with your health insurance companies. That's good. I, uh, so many of the, the uh, health issues that we're running into within the, within the States, at least, are things that are preventable with better lifestyle. And, yeah, true. Uh, ultimately, the biggest challenge to that is really – how much people are forced to work in order to just make a living. Yes, um, absolutely. at least in the States, but there are, there are definitely things that we can do in order to kind of help people out. One of the things that I try to do is if I have a TV on, if uh -huh. I'm watching a movie or, or something that I'm trying to also do something else, like I can, I can walk on a treadmill and watch a TV show. I can, um, I can watch a TV show and practice guitar. So those are all things that I'm like, all right, I'm going to try to do something that's good for my health and for my brain and, and help me de-stress while I'm doing something that's passive. Yes. Yeah, so one of the things that I read was that a lot of techies now um, are getting uh, treadmills and then setting mm -hmm. them on like speed one yep. and then getting those those um, those mounts so they could put their, uh, their laptops and all that kind of stuff on the treadmill. And they basically just work all day long walking at speed one very light walking. And because the thing is, is they, the data indicates that if you sit more than six hours a day, you know, it's just really bad for your health. And so what they're trying to get to is like, instead of sitting all day long or standing all day long, just walk real slow, just walk. Your body keeps moving constantly all day long. And, uh, and it's not bad if you put it on one, I've tried it and it's like, you're barely even moving. It's like, you could type and everything and it doesn't even affect you. Yeah. One's too slow for me. I need to get to like at least two. It's, it feels like we're like not doing it's, it's uncomfortably slow. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, totally. So 
I think that there are some things that this can definitely grow into. Um, uh-huh. We can talk about kind of, you already mentioned what are the future devices are, and I think we'll get to that. Uh, there are some things when it comes to activity tracking, it doesn't do very well, I think. It's really good at steps. It's really good at, uh, so anything that's, you know, mobility-based, running, walking, jogging is great. It doesn't seem to work very well for other forms of exercise. Like if I'm doing yoga, it doesn't track it at all. If I'm doing any kind of resistance exercise, it yeah. just thinks I'm stressed out. If I, <laughs> I don't think it can track swimming at all. It might be able to track um, uh, cycling based on the GPS, but I don't know yep. how well it would do on a stationary bike. So those are areas where I think that it can uh, improve. Uh, but it seems to be really reliant on the accelerometer data and those motion profiles in order to track exercise. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, let me ask you this bigger question. Why do you think big tech wants to get into this space? Well, I think that the healthcare industry in general has been very slow to improve. And a lot of, I mean, we, we've worked with some of these companies and they are kind of addressing it, but they're slow. They're way behind relative to the tech companies. It's just being unaddressed. Just even moving data back and forth took way too long. Um, we now have logins for for our medical providers. So you can see all the tests and messages and things like that, but it took way too long and it was slow and they're still not great. This is something I think that, Tech companies like Amazon, who's getting big into this, have looked at and said, hey, we can have an impact here. We can move things along. We can um, have a new uh, product vertical for us that can bring money in for us, provide uh, provide value to users, and maybe push the competitors out there, the other health tech companies, to move forward. So it becomes, why, why not? Yeah. No, it's true. I, I think... It's an eight hundred billion dollar a year industry, the medical industry, mm-hmm. and uh, and it's largely I, slow, outdated, and and it, it's slow for a purpose. In some cases, though, like you know, you want to sure. really, really thoroughly test stuff before you know you put it you know on people. Yeah, you, you, but that, in our experience, like testing doesn't mean sitting around and waiting and talking about doing the test for six months. Yeah, <laughs> it just exactly. Means- yeah actually getting out there and testing it and taking your time with the test itself. But there's so much analysis paralysis within this industry. I I think this is a great place to be because the fact is, is that the data that comes from millions and millions and millions of people regarding, um, you know, heart rate and things like that, that's data that the the medical industry does not have. Right. I mean, they they maybe get a little bit of it because they're putting it in the database every time you have a physical or something like that. And they can kind of look at that, but this is like real time data. Like, you know, mm-hmm. how they're understanding how humans function and move and, and stress and all that kind of stuff. They're going to have the biggest data sets in the world from this stuff. Um, can that be super helpful in the long run? Yeah, because those data sets can be popped into artificial intelligence and then those systems can go and like help figure out problems, solve problems, you know, help enrich our lives. I mean, the user gets a, a little bit of feedback, which is like, hey, you know, you're sleeping well, or you're stressing out or take a walk or do whatever. But the big tech companies are actually getting the real data that actually is going to solve the big, big, big problems down the down the line. Yeah. And it can help them to determine what data do people need? How, how can they be presented in a better way? How do individuals who meet a certain kind of behavioral profile, what works best for them as mm-hmm. far as what data they need and how it's organized and how it's what's emphasized and what's de-emphasized. So that's something that we're going to see improve over time. Um, And part of that is just getting in there, getting their feet wet, getting the experience, um, forming relationships with other uh, like traditional tech uh, health companies like Varian or Genentech or those kinds of companies in order to have kind of collaboration and information going back and forth in order to kind of figure out what is going to be helpful for people and also make the money because that's that's what the name of the game is oh absolutely at the end of the day these companies just want to make money right um but if we can benefit from the ways in which they're making money that's awesome too one of the things i wanted to point out um before we kind of talk about like where we think this stuff is going is that the ecosystem you pick matters uh these are not 
I mean, Aura is kind of a, a device that works across different ecosystems, whether it be Apple or Samsung or Google or whatever. But it seems to me like these devices are being developed and harmonized within the ecosystem. So like Apple's watch, you know, everything works so perfectly and smoothly as it's, you know, connected to your phone and that kind of stuff. So the nice thing is, is that it seems like every ecosystem has health monitoring capabilities at this point, whether you're, you know, on the Android side, the Apple side, or you're on the outside and you want to get an Aura or some other device. It looks like mm-hmm. a lot of the big players are, you know, playing with them because they're going to get some of that data. So it does seem like it's headed. It's definitely heading in the right direction with, in regard to like allowing anyone to get this type of information. Yeah, I think that one of the big things that we're going to see is that there are going to be features that are available um, within a certain ecosystem that are going to be more difficult for them to integrate across ecosystems. So, for example, right now, if you have a, if you're an iOS, it makes sense for you to get an Apple Watch, and an Apple Watch can do everything that a Pixel Watch can do, and a, and a Pixel Watch can do everything that a Galaxy Watch can do. Um, I've noticed what going recently from a Samsung phone to a Google phone that my uh, my Galaxy Buds, which are really good wireless headphones, uh, worked better a little bit. Um, just a little bit on the Samsung phone than it did on the on the Google phone. It's still mm-hmm. good enough, but there are differences. And I think that's going to be true with a lot of these devices that if you are um, using a lot of um, Samsung wearables, then it makes sense for you to have a Samsung phone or, or vice versa. Same thing with if you have a Pixel or if you have an, I, an iOS device. Uh, Aura, I think, is doing a good job of going cross-platform and using these APIs in order to move things back and forth between different platforms. But companies like Apple kind of like having their walled garden and not being as interactive with other devices. Yep. And sometimes they mean that that features that are available um, through an integration, a native integration between a device and its and its um, software and its other hardware and things like that might not be as fluid or as smooth or uh, might not even have those features at all if you're going cross-platform. True, true. And and they all want to provide personalization through it, throughout the ecosystem. Mm-hmm. But let me ask you a question. In order to like personalize and be connected with your ecosystem and to have all this stuff integrated, how far would you allow them to go when it when it comes to your medical information? Like if it had the option for it to connect to, I don't know, let's say you're part of Stanford, right? Stanford health program, and then it can look at your medical data and it could take all its data and plop it into their data and share it back and forth. Would you be okay with that? Or are you only interested in the one way where it's like it sends the data from your phone to your healthcare provider, but not vice versa? Well, if, if it was me, I would not want that. I would like them to develop that capability, but not for me to use. I'll tell you who I would want that for is for like my mom, right? Some For me, I would want to go in and pick like manually enter information that I think will be meaningful or that I want to track. But I don't think that's something that my mom or, or someone within her generation will typically be interested in doing, able to do, like I have to do it for her, or she might insert in, put stuff in incorrectly. But for something like that, I think it's useful. Uh, I'm, I would rather do it myself. That way I have control over what's information is put in and what is being yeah. personalized. I'm less concerned about the privacy thing because I've worked within these companies and I know they don't, they don't care about me yeah. on that level. Um, what I've noticed from personalization within the system that I'm using, which is the Pixel Fitbit, um, kind of system is the this the stress tracking is still very new, so they're working out a lot of kinks. And there's plenty of times where it says, "Hey, you seem stressed," and I was like, "Well, I was on a roller coaster. I wasn't stressed. I was I was like having a good time." Yeah. Um, but there's a process where you go in and you start logging what you felt in that moment, and it gets better at identifying what counts as a stress response and what counts as like. You know, you're cheering at a football game or something like that. Uh, and it's gotten better. It's gotten more accurate. And that's one of the things I think about as it gets the data, it'll be able to personalize what that thing means for you as opposed to what it could potentially mean in the vast gamut of all all potential things that could happen. 
Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. I'm kind of the same way. Like I'd love to share the data that I have with the doctor and have it integrated and then see it instead of just judging me based on the moment I walk in for a physical. Mm-hmm. Instead, I like them to look at, oh, the last year, you're like, wow, a lot going on, a lot of activity, yeah. a lot of this, a lot of that. That's great. You know, so that's how I'm going to base my conversation with you uh, because I think it's more accurate. It makes more sense. Yeah, um, I think that like data going from um, the device or, or your app to the doctor, I'd be 100% okay with especially if you can select which data to share Uh on a um on a regular basis just like a constant stream um but the other way about every diagnosis or every like test result or something like that going to the device and the ecosystem i'd be that is something i'd be less likely to do exactly exactly so let's wrap this up with some predictions here you go first like where do you where do you think these things are going to go i mean they've been hammering at these things for what a decade or two? Yeah, I, I, there are things that we've known. Uh, when when we're, uh, wearables were first starting up, we did a lot of research in this field with our partners. And there are definitely more things that they can do that they haven't done yet. So you can track how much vibration is coming through your hands, for example, with the wristwatch. If you're somebody who works with your hands, if you're a carpenter, or if you're a uh, somebody who does road work and you're using a jackhammer, it can track what kind of damage that could be happening to your joints. That could be a feature that comes out. Uh, it can track through an interstitial needle that doesn't penetrate your skin and just goes kind of in a little bit. It can track your blood sugar. I like that a lot. That's cool. So you can just have a watch that tracks your blood sugar and it could then tell you like, maybe if you're not diabetic, maybe if you're starting to become pre-diabetic, it'll let you know without having to come in and do an A1C. Um, so I think we'll see more features come up. I think we'll see, a, um, uh, AI, um, as far as what the wearable is tracking at all, uh, cause people are getting more comfortable with this and they, and they see the value so they can open things up to, to doing more. Uh, I think that's a good part of the process. I think we'll see AI get involved and start doing some, uh, on device or, uh, on within app analyses of information and then kind of aggregating across populations and doing some really interesting stuff, both from a big data perspective and for the individual. And that will change how the data is presented or how it's uh, how they make sense of it, the conclusions that are drawn. Um, and then, like you said before, the new devices, I think we'll see some new form factors. I think we're going to see earbuds are kind of going to be a thing, but like people don't wear earbuds full time. So it has a little bit less of a of an appeal to it. Goggles, I think, are cool. I think we're going to see eyeglasses at some point. I think we're going to see AR enabled eyeglasses that can also track some of your health data and maybe even some vision stuff in order to determine like how well are and how quickly are Brian's eyes focusing on certain things or how quickly is the iris responding and that can provide some key health information. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I think this, this stuff's heading in that direction. I, I think the other thing I would just add to that is that, I do feel like we're going to get to a point where um, this is just covered by insurance and it's free for everyone. Yeah. So whether you have insurance through the state, like we have in the state of California, you know, covered California, um, or you purchase your insurance or your company purchases it, we just provide these. This is how we take care of ourselves is that if you want one of these, you can have it. Um, and if you share your data with your doctor, then your premiums go down, like just incentivize people to want to be healthier through the sharing of data with experts that can, that can help you. And I think that's where this is going to end up eventually. I hope it does. I I really do feel like all these things should be free and covered under insurance if you want them. Just like when you turn 65 and you have uh, Medicare or Medicaid and you get the free gym membership, right? It's like, why not offer gym memberships now so that you're healthier when you're 65, right? Um, All of that stuff is heading in that direction. And I think it's, it's exciting. It's exciting times. And I, I like the ring a lot. I think it's cool. I'm, I'm, I'll try this one out. Um, I tried out the aura ring before and I really liked it. Um, I'll try this one out as well when it's available on iOS. Um, it's not available on iOS right, the, right this moment, but you can get it and we can, we can explore it. But well, anyways, key, key question before we close up. Yeah. What is your prediction about an Apple ring? I don't know. 
they, they're very, very specific about what hardware they bring out. Um, it feels like something that they they could do. Like it does feel mm-hmm. like an Apple thing to do is to have it a It feels like a no brainer to me. Yeah. Like if I was them, I'd acquire Aura, bring the team in and then work on the form factor, right? Even the Aura one looks beautiful, but they could even do better. They could tie it into all the colors of the watch and the phones and really break it together. I think it's it's a no brainer for Apple. But at the same time, Apple's, you know, they might want to double down on watches or something. You know, it's it's hard to yeah. say with them. They're very secretive. They don't. They are. It, it does after. feel like okay. Well, we can take the existing sensors. We can just copy this, this yeah. company. We'll just have a better software layer behind it. Um, I don't think there's too much room for advancement at this point in time on the the hardware. Uh, but they are also really good at getting things slim and small. And this is mm-hmm. an example of one of one of my criticisms of the rings that are out there now is they all look big, chunky, masculine rings. And there's probably a lot of women out there who are, are going to think to themselves, this just looks like inelegant on my hand. Yeah. If Apple could come out and achieve something that looks more like a women's, a woman's ring to sit alongside the man's ring, I think that would be a substantial improvement. And it's, and it's yeah. finally taken advantage of their obsession with getting everything as thin as light as possible, even unnecessarily so. Yeah, I think where the concern probably comes in is whether or not the ring would compete with sales of the watch. Right. Um, I again, I'd be really interested to know this data, um, and we're probably not going to do it unless somebody pays us to do it. But uh, the amount of who buys these rings, and whether or not it is people who own watches also, and to cover uh, use cases in which they wouldn't want to wear a watch, or if it's just a straight up cannibalization, and people buy either or. I think it's. I think that people will tend to buy both. That's that's my hypothesis. Yeah. I don't know. I, I feel the other way. I actually feel like, you know, I would look at it and go, okay, which one do I want? But you have uh, a watch already. But I have a watch. See, I don't want to wear a, an Apple watch, right? Or an Android watch, right? I like these other watches. I have one that's made out mm-hmm. of gold from Hawaii and stuff. I like they're, they're pretty and I use them when I surf and stuff or go out in the water in the bay. So uh, I'm more I'm more of a likely candidate for a ring. Um, mm-hmm. But we'll see. Yeah. I don't know. But anyways, this is super fun. I can't wait to try these things out. I love gadgets. So whenever we get to talk about gadgets, I get excited. So thanks everyone uh, so much for taking the time to listen to us. We really appreciate it. We'll post all our updates as well as video versions of the podcast on YouTube at The X Podcast. Please go to the channel and subscribe if you have not already. If you like this podcast and found it interesting or informative, it helps us a great deal if you subscribe and leave a review on whatever platform you use. Thank you all. And we'll see you all next week. <laughs>